So welcome back for another night of story time. I'm going to apologize for missing on Friday. That was uh, my bad. <laughs> you know, what can I say? I'm not really used to sticking to a regular schedule. And part of why I'm doing story time is to help me get a little bit back onto those regular schedules of things. So let's just remember a touch of what we read last week. We read a lot about how it was that the great peacemakers started birthing back into the tribes in America, in the Americas, attempting to support them in their remembering and understanding and awareness of their true nature and their true selves, which of course is to be custodian, guardian, ego, spirit guardians of these vessels which are ultimately greater reflections or reflections of a greater consciousness, our star consciousness, who wants to come play in this reality set. And they're like, God, you guys are so busy fighting with each other. Oh my God, we can't even come in and play anymore. And so in the last chapter, we read about Adadarho. And if we remember, he was considered to be a horrible monster that everybody was terrified of and that would club and kill women and children and indiscriminately and everybody hated him, nobody liked him. Uh, and uh, he was exactly who they went to go see first and foremost when they left after creating the very first foundation of a unified tribes. Uh, and then Adadarho helped support them in getting the support of a tribe of people who is the least likely to join uh, and the hardest to get to join because of the transformation that they saw in Adadarho as he received this information from the star consciousness and understood understood himself better and learned and evolved with it. So remembering how powerful it is to deliver the message even into the spaces where we're terrified to go or the darkness has us. And um, and and if we also can recall his his companion was his original greatest foe in the Huron tribe because at the beginning and also became his greatest champion was the most terrified or had the most to hold against Adadarho as had his children and wife been killed by him. So him going there was another symbolic representation of even if you have the most just cause and reason to be in anger of somebody, to hate them, to separate yourself from them, to judge them, to deem them as unworthy, they still have a purpose and uh, and and it was in his journey to Darho that he began to forgive himself as well. So we'll move on to chapter nine, Tree of Peace. The vision that first came to me one starlit evening some five winters ago was now rapidly becoming reality. During the past year the Seneca had become the fifth nation to agree to the peace. A gathering of the principal representatives of the Iroquois tribes had now been called to formally establish the League. For months, runners and braves had been traversing the countryside, inviting not only the chiefs and leaders, but all who cared to attend to meet at the headwaters of the Onondaga, a sacred lake in what is today Upper New York State. They were told to gather around the largest tree that could be found four days before the full moon when the geese fly south. Virtually everyone in inhabitation of the five nations who was fit to travel set out that fall for the appointed location. For weeks they had been coming, gathering, camping in anticipation of this historic and long-awaited occasion. By the time the Hiawatha had arrived, and I had arrived, there was no question as to the largest tree. It stood prominently in the center of a huge natural basin at the edge of the lake. The surrounding area as far as the eye could see was filled with the encampments of five nations. The base itself, however, had been kept clear for it had and the open area around the base of the majestic pine had been designated as the site of the first Supreme Council of the new Iroquois Confederacy. 
It was on a windy day and sunny morning that Hiawatha and I arrived. In silence, the others gathered to greet us. With no words spoken, the chiefs and principal warriors of the Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, and Mohawk nations, joined us in forming a circle around the basis of the magnificent tree. Surrounding our circle were thousands of men, women, and children. They had come not so much to hear the words that were spoken at this historic meeting, for voices did not carry much beyond the circle of the central council, but to feel the spirit of the occasion. Though there were many thousands gathered around us, so respectful were they, and so silent that our initial prayers were broken only by the sound of woodpecker and chattering squirrel. For three days we observed the wigwam of silence. From dawn until dusk, no words were spoken. Only the fourth day of the wigwam of Tori began. Only on the fourth day, the wigwam of, Tor wigwam of Oratory began. Standing upon a great moss-covered rock about 30 feet from the base of a towering pine, Hiawatha spoke with the eloquence that had served our purpose so well during the preceding years. He spoke of the bird tribes, the winged beings of light who came to earth calling upon the mortal bodies of flesh. He spoke of the law that rules throughout the natural world, the law that one receives in the course of a lifetime, exactly what he or she has given, that one experiences oneself as the same conditions that he or she creates for others. Hiawatha spoke of the great peace that the whole of the Americas had experienced for hundreds of generations. When his simple law was honored, respected, and understood, all present could not hear his voice, but the leaders in the central circle followed closely every word that he offered. For by this time, Hiawatha was regarded as the finest orator that perhaps had ever walked the Americas. Many of the chiefs were not only listening to what he said, but studying his manner, that they might bring something of his spirit to their own people as they in turn spoke of these truths in the years that would follow this momentous event. Hiawatha spoke of a great lie that had become deeply rooted in the hearts and in the consciousness of all of the world's people. A great lie, he called it, that had stolen the happiness and disrupted the harmony of the nations here gathered. Recognizing the opportunity for a symbolic teaching that could be witnessed by all present, Hiawatha referred to this great lie as a I once had before, the tree of war. He called it, and throughout the multitude that surrounded us, the words were quickly whispered from one to another. The tree of war, Hiawatha repeated, has been firmly rooted in the habits of our most recent generations as this pine is rooted in the earth. It may seem that a tree as large as this is too well established, too firmly implanted to ever be removed, and yet, he said, this giant of the forest can be toppled by something as simple as this. Here Hiawatha held up a single hand, and though every word was not conveyed in the multitude, the gist of Hiawatha's meaning was soon grasped by these present. He paused until it was understood, and then he continued. Something as simple as a ha human hand, created by the Great Spirit, with five fingers, each one separate, individual and independent, Something this simple can topple this great tree when five fingers work together as one. When our five separate nations are working together, we have great power. Let our five nations become the five-fingered hand of the great spirit. Let us eradicate the tree of war. The habit habits of warfare, the ways of violence, not only from our nations, but from the nations we will influence in the generations to come. Human hands serve the purposes of the Great Spirit, given again to the purposes of peace, can uproot even this greatest of trees in all of the forests. We paused then, and I spoke quietly to the spirit of the tree, asking its understanding. 
Would it be willing, I asked, to release this particular tree form and inspire instead another? Would it open itself to a death as glorious and meaningful as its life had been? Your life has been a good, long, and healthy one, if I said. You have served the forest well, but the two-footed dwellers of this land need a teaching that only you can provide. They need this teaching that they too might serve the forest and its creatures as you have served. For the sacred cause of peace between the human nations, would you, would you be willing, O oh, Grandfather Pine, to open yourself to a death that will inspire all human races for generations to come? To be remembered in song and legend as long as there are people in this world? All assembled waited for the tree's response. Slowly, gradually, we felt the emotional language of the tree speaking to our hearts. Yes, the spirit of the tree replied. I've long known that this summer was to be my last, that the time was near to release this form for another. Such a death will be an honor. I have been waiting for you, Dagna Wadwa, proceed. Then Hiawatha invited those present to bend down and use only their hands to begin digging into the ground, into the forest soil, beneath the needles and the moss, all, and all joined and began digging a trench around the base of this tree that Hiawatha likened to the well-rooted tree of war. He forbade the use of any tool or implements, but the enthusiasm of the chiefs was strong. And as they dug, their hands were joined by the hands of all those who were able to get near enough to be of any use. Soon a deep trench appeared around the base of the tree. It was not long before the ancient branches rippled slightly as a slight shiver ran through the tree from the ground upward, signifying the departure of the spirit. The first beginnings creaked of instability and were faintly audible around its base. Hiawatha held up his hand and called a stop to the digging. He invited me to step from the, among the circle. I walked through the trench that surrounded the trees and climbed until I stood beside a mighty trunk. Working together, he said, holding up my hand, fingers spread for all to see. Working together as the fingers of one hand, our five nations have great power. For behind us then is the power of the Great Spirit. When we align ourselves with the purpose of heaven and act in common accord, we have all the natural forces working with us, supporting us, helping us through the truth, though the truth may be simple, as simple as a human hand, and though it may be gentle, as gentle as a hand, aligned with the powers of heaven and the powers of earth, that single hand can stand up to the greatest lie, to the most entrenched habit or tradition, to the most stubborn and firmly rooted illusion. And that single hand can topple it as easily as my single hand now topples this tree. During the time I had been speaking, many claimed they saw towering above the tree, the great winged beings of light who bring the Creator's power to the earth. As I placed my hand upon the tree, many claimed to have heard the rustling of their wings, but even those who did not see or hear those things felt the rush of the wind that joined my human strength as the great tree, with a rumbling, cracking eruption, ripped itself from its roots in the earth and fell crashing to the forest floor. The power and solemnity of the occasion were not were so marked, not one warrior's head turned, not one heart, human heart, in fear skipped a beat. 
Such a deep atmosphere of trust filled the assembled multitude. No one was injured in the fall of the tree. Some said that they saw it caught by the hands of angels and gently lowered to the ground where there also those who said in and after years that they had toppled the tree of my own accord. But so it is that stories grow, so it is that legends are made. Neither Hiawatha nor I lost any time in making the fullest of the symbolism. The fallen pine had left a cavity so large that a subterranean current of muddy water could be seen moving sluggishly in its depths. We invited all present to throw into the gaping cavity all weapons that had ever shed human blood or in any way been used in war. During the rest of the day, as the sun slowly sank into the west, warriors followed the example of their chiefs, and soon the cavity was filled with a great assortment of the weapons that would never again be used against human hands. When the sun rose the next day, all hands joined together in throwing the rich forest soil over the cavity that now contained the discarded implements. Soon there was a great mound when the weapons of war were buried beneath the nearly six feet of earth. Hiawatha climbed to the top of the mound and spoke. Here beneath our feet is where all weapons of war belong, among the currents that flow in the nether regions, beneath the level of human knowing. Beneath the level of our interest or concern, let us bury these weapons of conflict and release the hatred and the mistrust that produced them. They do nothing for our people but cause suffering. They do not serve the needs of those who use them half so well as commerce, communication, brotherhood, and cooperation. Let us bury these weapons from sight, never to be considered again, and in their place let us plant a new tree, a tree of peace and understanding. With a well-proportioned young white pine that had carefully been selected and prepared, I climbed to the top of the mound to join Hiawatha. As I held the tree, Hiawatha knelt and scooped out a place for it in the freshly turned soil. When the place was prepared, I knelt beside him, and together we planted the new tree, the tree of the great peace, the tree that in centuries to follow became the most well-known tree east of the Mississippi, the tree of the great long leaves. As the leaders of the five nations sat in a circle around the newly planted tree, Hiawatha spoke to them in a new way in a new tone, with a spirit that he now drew from all our hearts, with a voice that was only made possible through the profound harmony and agreement of the thousands who had gathered with us. We are not at the beginning of a new time. We are at the beginning of a new time, he said, a time when the violent tendencies of human beings on islands far from the shores of this lake far from the forests, far from any lands that we know, will grow and grow and become ever more restless. We are living in the beginning of the end of times. It is good because it is the beginning of the healing that will remove the dishonest tree of warfare from human hearts forever. But just as the darkest hour of the night is just before the dawn of the new day, so things will get worse before they get better. They, we are living in the beginning of times when the lies that turn hearts from the path of peace will whisper more vigorously in human thoughts than ever before. So it is fitting at the beginning of these times when the powers of warrior ways will grow in the hearts of peoples from far, far from these shores, right and fitting that we honor the precedent of peace established here long ago. 
We are living in the land where people from all parts of the world will one day come to be healed. It is appropriate that today we plant the tree of the peaceful way. This tree we had planted here will grow and flourish in our own understanding, in our children's and in our children's children. For twelve more generations this tree shall be strong. And during these generations much better ways will come to all the people who live beneath its teachings. The truths of this tree will flower not only in Iroquois hearts, but in the hearts of tribes and nations far from these shores. But then a violent storm will come. A pale race will come from the east, and they will be more numerous than all the game from here to the hunting ground of the Dakotas. And in the storm which will last for five long centuries, the tree of the great long leaves will be utterly demolished. Not one twig or needle will remain to be found. Men will have even forgotten where once it stood. A time of sorrow far worse than any we have ever known will fill all the lands. The numbers of our people will become few, our songs will be forgotten. Yet just when the grandmothers and the grandfathers begin to lose hope, just when the last storytellers have almost forgotten, Suddenly, it will be seen that in the very storm that uprooted the tree of the great long leaves, its cones were carried to the four directions, its seeds scattered by the far winds, and in the hilly country it will have quietly taken deep root. But it will grow unnoticed at first. The white race from the north will bring with them a power black, powerful black people from the south, and in time, from the direction of the setting sun, they will be joined by a yellow people. These three races will come the three directions to meet us here on these very hunting grounds. Our children will mingle with their children, and when the storm is past, the ways of peace and cooperation will flower among the people of the world and spread to every land, and all the great spirit's children will live together in harmony. Some day, spoke Hiawatha, these same thoughts that flower in the, our understanding today will reach out into the stars beyond the farthest clouds and bounce back, echoing the teachings of the flowering tree. And all the nations of all the world will hear these thoughts of peace and be amazed. They will know then the thoughts of God, the songs of the winged ones shall be sung again in the villages of the earth, and the people of the four races shall after that live as one, even as the mighty leaves of this tree live as one. And there shall be no more war, more, no more sickness, nor untruth. I give this prophecy to tell your children and your children's children to repeat around your teepees, fires, and the generations to come. When the great storm comes and it seems that the truth is for a time extinguished, hold fast, my brave ones, remain true, my chiefs. Be steady, all you healers and children of the great spirit. For, for from this beginning that we make today will come eventually, when the storm of five centuries is past, a new world where the peaceful ones will rule. And in that world, the barbarous custom of warfare shall have so far receded, even the storytellers will have forgotten it. Today we make a covenant with the people of our five nations. We make an agreement to honor the ways of love and the ways of justice, the ways of peace. We're not in truth a separate people. Each one of us here in this multitude is a single leaf on the, on the great spirit tree. When we go within ourselves to touch the river of life that runs at the heart of our innermost being, each one of us 
touches the same leaf that flows within our sisters and our brothers, even as the same sap flows through all the leaves of a tree. Your life is God's life. The Great Spirit is not just outside of you, but within you as well. Listen to the Great Spirit. In your innermost thoughts, you will hear teachings superior to any that I or Degnawadya will ever share with the words of our mouths. Hiawatha paused and bent his head while those present considered this truth. After a moment, he looked up and continued speaking louder now so that his voice carried even to the distant rim of the basin. Just as you do not see the leaves on any healthy tree in the forest contending among themselves or fighting with one another, so neither is there any need for people to contend or fight or in anything but friendliness compete. When the Great Spirit is known within, in communities where truth and honesty are, are honored, people live in harmony with one another. They experience with their own life and the life of the Creator as one. They know that our people are like the leaves and our tribe like the branches of a wondrous tree. They know that the life of the two-footed and the four-footed and the winged ones, the life of the plants and the rivers and the seas, the life even of the very sun, moon, and stars grows also from that tree all come from a single trunk of being, the eternal being that we know as God. In this way, the Great Spirit lives within all things, within every plant and animal, every tree, every one of us here present. As Hiawatha spoke these words, he moved, moved about the mound, making descriptive gestures, drawing pictures in the air, pointing at times to the newly planted tree, evoking all the passion of his former warrior spirit. He channeled an enormous energy into conveying to these gathered not just an idea or a concept, but as much as he was able, an actual experience of the awareness that he himself knew in those moments. One could sense the chiefs as they felt it, understood it, and experienced it each in turn. From time to time when one would stand and, with a spirit nearly as beautiful as Hiawatha, share a word or two of the great truth as it pertained to him and his people. But the chiefs kept their commitments brief, comments brief, for, I think, like myself, they were truly awed by the Great Spirit whom Hiawatha in these moments had obviously become. Some say that as Hiawatha spoke they saw a great winged form extend high above him into the trees. I saw only Hiawatha, but I saw him as I have known him in the Andes, in the Himalayas, in the great eternal spirit that is there was no presence overlighting Hiawatha. It was the great eternal spirit that is the reality of every human being that had simply found a welcome home in his heart. Hmm. Love that. And really that's the whole goal, right? Like that's what we're all working towards doing is being able to find a, a open home in our heart for God to come in. So tomorrow night we'll read chapter 10, We Establish the Confederacy. Uh, just a few little notes for those of you who made it this far and are interested. Um, all of my teachings, my classes, they're all built around teaching the principles and concepts that I've learned by my relationship, healing my relationship with my star consciousness. Uh, I've learned from other people, but mostly the lessons come from within. And that's really what my programs are designed to do, is to teach you how to tap into that inner knowing and to heal that relationship with yourself so you can allow God's consciousness to seat within you. Uh, so 
My Life Mastery program I've been teaching for the last six years now starts up again in May, May 5th. We run on the first and third Thursday, or I'm sorry, Tuesday, Tuesday nights uh, from now, uh, from May through October. And those classes are $33 a class. Uh, if you want, you can sign up for the whole program and get the six month of training for free. And I'm also building a brand new program, uh, A to Z Guide to Energy. And I'm super excited about it. It's going to help support me in building some fun, ex fun toys and experiments. It's a very different class from Life Mastery. Life Mastery is a very serious and intensive training program. It's designed to reconnect you with your full consciousness of self. It's very intensive classes. They're powerful. They're transformative. Um, a to Z to your guide to energy is going to be playful and fun. We're going to take a topic and study that topic. We're going to look at it from awareness perspective. Then we're going to take it into a discernment perspective by playing with things, playing with energy, playing with awareness, playing with ideas. I want, my goal in this class is to get you experimenting, playing, giving you ideas and ways to play in your own life and with each other, as well as to give you a really strong working knowledge of what the basic information you need to know how to be able to work with your mind, body, spirit, complex, and unison. Uh, so I'm super excited about those. Those are starting up April 1st. They're $5 a class because it's brand new material, brand new content. If you're interested in either of these programs, email me at jesse at healingpathwalkers.com. Uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow night. Thank you.